we'll have prayer tonight for those that would like to partake, given by Councilman Copeland, and the pledge will be by Mayor Pro Tem Bench. If you'd like to participate, please bow your heads. Gracious Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity for us to come together as city officials as well as our community to make decisions on the betterment of our community. Father, we ask for your guidance and grace and wisdom as we continue to move forward in this great city. We thank you for all the presentations that we will hear tonight. We thank you that although this information will be a lot, that it will be concise and we will be able to get out at an expected time. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for continuing to covering us as we continue to serve our community. Father, we ask that you touch our police officers, our firefighters, those, our social workers, those who are working with those who need the most support. So thank you again for your guidance and your grace this evening. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Council Member Sylvia. Present. Council Member Ab Williams is absent. Council Member Balls. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bench. Present. Council Member Ostash is absent. Council Member Garcia. Here. Council Member Flores. Here. Council Member Copeland. Present. Here. And Mayor Moore. Present. We have seven present and two absent. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to City Council tonight. This is a meeting of City Council. Audience, I ask that you remain from clapping, blowing, and any obnoxious behavior. Okay. All council people, let's put those phones on vibrate or silence. And let's put these computers as well on silent. Audience, if you would do that, I would truly appreciate it. Again, I need a phone. So you, your phone go off is mine. Okay. <laughs> Madam Clark, do we have any announcements? Yes, Mayor, we have a couple. The convenience station will be open this Saturday, April 13th from 8 a.m. to noon. Residents may utilize the station to dispose of bulky items or other miscellaneous items that need to be disposed of. The yard waste collection has begun for the 2024 season and pickup is on your regular trash day. Yard waste should be placed in biodegradable paper yard waste bags or in a 33 gallon trash bin marked with a yard waste sticker. Those stickers are available in the clerk's office. And finally, the item listed on this agenda under miscellaneous business has been removed due to the FOIA appeal being withdrawn by the requester. And Mayor, that takes us to public hearings. Our first on the agenda tonight is regarding the 2024-2025 Community Development Block Grant Program, Emergency Solutions Grant Program, Home Investment Partnership Program. Okay, the purpose of a public hearing is for the public to address council as a whole and for council to hear comments from the speakers regarding the specific action that is being requested. Speakers must limit their remarks to the subject of the public hearing. Please state your name and say if you are in support or in opposition of what you're talking about, the subject, public matter, the subjects of the public hearing. The main speaker or the designated representative, you have 10 minutes. Anyone that speaks about this after is three minutes. This is not a question or answer period. You cannot direct anything directly to the city council members. This is a public hearing. Madam Clerk. You want to call for comments? This is where you call for comments. C comments. Okay. I'm sorry. We have the first one that is talking about regarding the 224. 224 225 community development block grant money. Do we have someone here that wants to address that step to the podium, please? Good evening, Mayor Moore, Mayor Pro Tem Bench, City Council, City Manager, and staff. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Valerie Tony, and I serve as chair for the Human Planning Commission. 
I am now serving my second term on the commission, and it is an absolute honor for me to present this brief narrative of recommendations for funding on behalf of the Human Planning Commission, HPC. I speak this evening on behalf of the HPC, and we hope the information we have prepared will assist you in your review and approval of the submitted allocations. The HPC met in November to interview Emergency Solutions Grant, ESG, applicants, and then in January of this year for Community, community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and home applicants. The applications were reviewed by CDBG staff, and the information was compiled and provided to the HPC and all of you. The HPC reviewed all the applicant applications and prepared questions to ask the applicants during their review interview. As you know, each applicant is allowed five minutes to make a presentation, and HPC is given 10 minutes to ask questions of them. Once interviews were finished, deliberations were done as a commission, and the allocations were prepared for your consideration. Please allow me a quick moment to acknowledge the members of the HPC. Commissioners, if you're here, please stand as I call your name. Commissioner Darlene Carpenter. Commissioner Carmen Hamilton, Commissioner Beth Carson Church, Commissioner Heather Collins, Commissioner Dennis L. Morrison, Commissioner Carla Lamar, Commissioner Stephen Myers, Commissioner Rollin C. Carter, myself, Commissioner Valerie Tony, Commissioner Suzanne Smokoska, Commissioner Lula Woodward, Woodard, Commissioner Michael Faust, Commissioner Roberta Bidwell, Commissioner Henry M. Porterfield, Jr., Commissioner Kathy Wagner, and Commissioner Deborah Melconian. <coughs> On behalf of the HPC, I would like to thank City Council Member Bill Ostash and Mayor Brenda Moore for attending many of the interview sessions. The support from the City Council was greatly appreciated by the HPC and CDBG staff. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this subject? Call number two. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this subject matter? Last and final time. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this public hearing? I need a motion to close the public I'll hearing. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Our second public hearing is regarding the proposed drinking water and clean water state revolving fund project plans. Call for comments. Call for comments. Uh, she already up there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anybody like to make she's already up there. It's like what I'm calling for. She's standing there. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's good to laugh. It's good to laugh. We have a representative who is going to be the main representative, and we will start with this young lady. Please state your name. My name is Megan Akamath. Can I get you to pull that mic closer to you? Sorry. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. My name is Megan Akamath. I am from Fishback, and I am joined with my colleagues Brian Lanzi and Andy Austin, who will be co-presenters for today's uh, public hearing for drinking water and clean water state revolving fund. Uh, before I start the public hearing, I'd like to say Mike and Ken have been very instrumental, and we've been working with Mike and Ken uh, on the you, grants. You're so soft, sweetie. We can't hardly hear you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. <laughs> I would like to repeat. Oh, um, it's much better. <laughs> Fishback has been working with um, Mike and Ken over several months, and uh, they have been very instrumental in all the grants and funding opportunities uh, that the city is yet to experience. And our first uh, grant and funding opportunity with their leadership has been uh, the application towards affordability and planning grants and 
the drinking water and clean, clean water state revolving funds application for that process has been the second uh, one that we've worked with them so far. So today's purpose of meeting is to uh, do a public hearing that is required by the state statutes for the drinking water and clean water state revolving fund. And the purpose of the meeting would be to cover the summary of project needs, the analysis of alternatives that we've, we've analyzed for drinking water and clean water, which is the wastewater projects, go through the selected alternatives, review the cost and annual debt service incurred by the project costs, cost to users, construction and operational impacts, if any, associated with these projects, mitigation measures that would be taken if there is an impact, and at last we would open it for public questions or comments. The public notice was advertised on city website on March 21st, and this is the actual hearing for that advertisement. So we have a combined project planning, which is essentially the document that will be submitted to the state for drinking water and clean water improvements throughout the city in, and including the overall service area that the city serves. The drinking water plan that you'll notice in the next few slides uh, is for just one year, and the clean water <clears throat> projects have been planned for the next five years. Like I mentioned earlier, project planning document is required by the state uh, to apply for the state revolving funds. <coughs> Drinking water and clean water programs, as the state calls it, um, provides communities with an opportunity for low interest water and wastewater loans for the project improvements. There's also an opportunity for principal forgiveness that qualify for any affordability criteria based on median annual household income and debt that the community already has. So going through that criteria, we have the city service area projects that you'll see in a minute for drinking water and also the clean water projects or the wastewater projects that have already been qualified for this affordability criteria. So there is a strong possibility, if any, for principal forgiveness or any low interest loan that the city might avail, depending on the funding. <coughs> so the next few slides are the project needs for the drinking water side of things. And like I mentioned, uh, the slide that's up there is for city service area, which means projects that are occurring within the city boundaries and fully allocated to the users within the city boundary. There are two important projects uh, that qualify for that critical need. The first one is lead service replacement, and this is required due to the Safe Drinking Water Act or compliance uh, related to the act. The water main improvements that was selected for improvements is would happen on Weiss Street, and there are several segments of Weiss, Weiss Street that have either old cast iron water mains dating back to like 1949 and have been prone to water main breaks. So mainly replacement due to age, undersized cast iron old water mains in transite water mains. The project is needed for system reliability and drinking water quality. The next slide uh, up on the screen is for the overall service area. This includes the city boundary and all the surrounding communities that the city uh, water system serves. There are three projects on here. Water main improvements, um, 
the water main improvement selected is for a parallel installation, parallel water main installation, with the reason being the existing water main that serves Birch Run Township, Birch Run Village, and Tamant Township is a single feed system, and there has been a history of frequent water main breaks in this area. So that's the need for the Birch Run Parallel Main. The second main, uh, the second project up on the screen is for the water treatment plant, and specifically for valve vaults that are in the site of the water treatment plant. They are needed for critical equipment uh, replacement and structural improvements because of system reliability and to provide safe drinking water. They are, the equipment in these vaults are beyond their useful life. The third project uh, chosen for the state revolving fund is the installation of mixers at Cotswold Reservoir. This is a raw water reservoir, and that reservoir has been, um, per Eagle recommendation, needs mixers to resolve any water quality issues. So the alternatives considered, uh, there were four alternatives considered for each of the projects that I mentioned. Alternative one, no action, which means do nothing. Alternative two, optimal performance of existing facilities. Alternative three, construction option. And alternative four, regional option. Regional option mostly doesn't apply in the case of the city because the city is a water and wastewater provider to the surrounding communities. The alternatives considered, again, are for the two categories that I mentioned earlier, and a detailed analysis of these alternatives have been included in the published planning document that is on the city website. So the selected alternative for city service area only projects, lead services, its construction alternative to replace all the potential lead services with new service lines. And the capital cost of the lead service replacement project is about 8.7 million over five years. The water main improvements for Y Street, the alternative selected is construction alternative for water main replacement. And the replacement sections of 16 inch cast iron water main and transite water mains. Capital cost is about 10 million. The selected alternative for the overall service area, Bertrand Water Main, it's again construction alternative with the installation of about 15,750 15, lineal feet of 16 inch water main with a capital cost of 11.5 million approximately. Water treatment well vault, the alternative chosen is optimal performance of exi existing facilities, and the capital cost is about 610. Our right, Timmy, this is up. Mm -hmm. I, I think they plan on doing a swap. But so I, think, I think they're going to tap out. Swap team, <laughs> tag team, let's go. <laughs> you got three minutes. Yep. Each of you. Yep, thank you. So. To continue uh, with what Megan was um, presenting, uh, this slide presents the anticipated cost for the, the water projects. Um, on the right uh, column, you see anticipated debt um, that has already been included in the increase <coughs> in the user rates. Um, and here's just a summary of those user rates for the various areas. Now moving on to the clean water um, projects. The clean water, even though it says clean water, is for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, the clean water is what gets discharged to the, the water after it's been processed. Um, so we looked at five areas of um, projects there. Preliminary treatment, primary treatment, UV disinfection, um, effluent, 
uh, pump station and solids handling. Um, along with the wastewater treatment plant area, we looked at retention basin. Uh, the first basin was the Weiss Retention Basin, um, located at Carlton and Weiss Street, one of the larger ones in Saginaw. Um, here are some items that need to be addressed, pump station, dewatering building, uh, the retention basin structure itself, um, chlorinization, yard piping. There's uh, additional RTBs or retention basins that need to be addressed throughout the city, um, and those are for flow metering, uh, chlorinization, instrumentation, and control improvements. Um, there's a river crossing that needs improvements and also uh, sewer improvements. Um, so like the drinking water, we looked at four alternatives for each of these projects. No action, optimization, construction, and regional. Um, and consider that for each of the projects. Uh, preliminary treatment, we chose alternative two. Um, basically, replacing kind, new pumps, piping, and gates. Um, the primary treatment at the wastewater plant, we also chose alternative two. Um, replacement in kind with uh, equipment. Um, rehabilitation of the structures. Uh, UV disinfection, um, they currently use chemical for disinfection. Uh, we chose alternative three, which would be um, UV, or UV disinfection, so you don't have any chemical that the operators have to work with. Um, effluent pump station we chose um, to replace in kind, and then solids handling would be replace in kind. They currently do lime stabilization. And I will let Brian. Good timing, young man. Good time. <laughs> All right. So the selected alternative on the Wise Basin we chose was alternative two. Um, and that's basically a rehab of the pump station that's out there, a replacement of the wet well isolation gates, some work to the vortex separator which moves grit, um, all the yard piping out there because it's all the ground settling. Um, and then replacement of the hypochlorite system. And then the selected alternatives on the, um, on the other basins is the flow meter and chlorine feed system at five other basins. Um, and then also the instrumentation and controls at those five, same five locations. Uh, the river crossing is alternative two. That's um, cleaning and lining of that sewer crossing and the sewer improvements throughout the city are random um, sewer lines that are in poor, poor shape that need to be replaced. And then the, um, going through the cost and the debt service on this, the projects are divided out over those five years. And so your first five years um, is 18 million, and then you got that same thing for each um, consecutive year, trying to spread those projects out. Um, and then the user cost increase now, just pointing out that the user cost that has already been implemented, it was um, the city's done very well planning and anticipation of these projects, and the user cost has already been put in place back in the July rate study. Um, so there's no additional fees from this. The impacts um, on the project, the surrounding areas, uh, historical and cultural, there are no impacts on the projects. They're in existing um, sites, so we're not changing anything. Uh, the wastewater projects will occur within the existing sites also. Natural and environmental, uh, there are no long-term environmental effects from these projects. And the social economic impacts, um, it'll be a benefit over the time with the, you know, improvements of the infrastructure and keeping the clean water up to date. <clears throat> Mitigation impacts, uh, traffic, there'll be short-term traffic uh, impacts with the projects when there's sewer work going on in the streets and the lead service lines being replaced. Um, air emissions, um, it'd be just your standard, you know, from the construction equipment, the exhaust and stuff from them. Noise, uh, same thing, standard construction noise and soil erosion, a little bit of uh, soil erode. Um, and then again, I just want to point out that Mike and Ken from the city have been instrumental and very helpful in helping us get through these grants and be able, being able to submit these. So, thank you. Thank you. 
three calls. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this public hearing matter? Number two, is there anyone else who would like to speak to this subject hearing matter? Last and final time, if there's anyone else that would like to speak to this public hearing, I need a motion to close this public hearing. So no. moved. Second. We've been moved and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. It takes us to public input. Ah. Speakers, you are still to remain courteous and polite at all times. The clerk will call you to the podium. You have three minutes. There's a timer on there. I need you to get all of the, everything you want to say within that three minutes. I will tell you closer to that three minutes to wrap it up. Remember, no booing, clapping, or obnoxious behavior. Madam Clerk. Our first speaker is Melanie Velasco. I made 13 copies, $21, and Lori, that's my friend helping me get my stuff out of the dumpster. Other than I know in court, and I have successfully got it condemned. I didn't expect that it would be a really big cost to me and a couple of really... But if I have to be evicted because of the condemned sign, everybody else, well, it's... Where are we going? Thank you. Um, yeah, the condemned sign's up there, and I've been told we cannot stay into the building after 5 o'clock. Uh, other people seem to think they got grace, but they do not have grace. It's supposed to be 8 to 5, you go in there, cannot be there. If it's condemned, it's condemned. Um, I'm in a wreck. Helmet. I had stuff in the breezeway, which I was allowed to have in the breezeway. And some Randall guy, he just started throwing it all in the dumpster pictures. And I had to have some, I'm a nervous wreck. Um, this is not right. And lights in the hallway, and, and uh, the, the pipes breaking, and water, and electrical. And wa you got that note, Ms. Moore? You got that note? <laughs> and... Um, Nobody likes me now, but the building is, was condemned and chips fall as they fall. Um, we're going to be homeless, yeah. But it's, this is a sad thing. My sister's a millionaire and she bought two houses in this. But we say something nice. This not so cool town. I wish she would have bought them in Ypsilanti where she was living with her husband. This all started when the bed bug got on her on, in the summertime when she came to visit me. You know how miserable the last holidays have been? Because I have bed bugs and cockroaches. I cannot visit anybody, and then when I go there, I have to show them that I'm not bit by bed bugs, and I don't have any cockroaches. Isn't that lovely? How wonderful, wonderful holidays I have been having. And my sister is dying, and I tried to spend two days with her yesterday. And today, I had to sift to get some more stuff out of the breezeway. Randall says he's going to throw it all in the dumpster. I have got to have time in order to get all of my belongings. I worked last week at getting it, uh, uh, most of it out of the apartment. I'm working on it. If I have to be out by 5 o'clock, everybody else cannot be there. I'm going back, and if anybody else is there after 5 o'clock and they trace into our building, 908 Court Street, I'm calling the police. Because the police told me, told me today that they cannot evict me and throw my stuff. Because Randall said he's going to throw my stuff into the dumpster because I had to get it all out of my apartment. That's not what the condemned sign says. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Your three minutes is I'm up. I'm so happy you got to meet the president. Thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> I'm going to see my doctor. Okay. Okay, so have a seat. Have a seat. I'm wearing there. Okay. 
I don't know what I'm going to do, but I think I'm not sick. I don't think I'm well. I'm well. Okay. This really makes me sick. Our next speaker is John Ayea. Good evening, Madam Good evening. Mayor, City Good Council, evening. staff, and fellow citizens. My name is John Ayala. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Mexican American Council, 1537 South Washington. I want to first thank you for the capital funding you provided us via ARPA. Little did we know how pivotal to our efforts, improvements, and repairs to our building would be. That being said, we find ourselves prioritizing what will be done and what will remain unattended. Not because we were wasteful or ostentatious in what we prioritized, but because the scope turned out to be much larger, larger than we expected. Let me give you some basic details. What was identified needing updating and repairs was 20,000 more than our allocation for ARPA capital funds. The remediation of asbestos, mold, lead, paint in our building was missed in our planning. The result was a need for remediation at a cost of 22000 We did not plan for window replacement, estimating anywhere from eighteen to 35000 At the least, replacing the basement windows would help us prevent a recurrence of mold issues. Our understanding of the program funds our understanding that program funds and capital funds could not cross over to cover shortages on one side or the other. We have been modest in our requests for funding. We want to make sure we could deliver and felt an obligation to only ask for what was needed. This in large measure is a recognition that for every dollar we receive is a dollar that won't go elsewhere. There are many good organizations in our community and if our being frugal affords opportunity, that is what we wanted to do. In our effort to stay within our capital budget, we will not have our second floor updated or repaired. We will also not re-insulate the building at this time. Those two actions will cover the funding shortage that we have of 42000 If permitted, the transfer of programming dollars could help us cover capital shortfalls. What remains unfunded are updates to the windows. All of our spending is local, providing a multiplier impact uh, to the city for our funds. In addition to, uh, to our desire to ensure a safe environment, our location places us where many see us every day. We want to represent ourselves and the city in a way that does Saginaw proud. Our, in our block, we have a beautiful church, beautiful law offices, and we want to step up our game and be a part of that. We want a good look for Saginaw. We're even contemplating color schemes that will complement our neighbors so that we blend in and, and enhance the total look. Let us take you on a tour of the building. Let us answer your questions. I have prepared a summary of our progress to date for Guidehouse. Included in that summary is how ARPA funds are being used. The paper trail is crystal clear. Please consider our request for additional capital funding or permission to make a transfer from programming to capital, or better yet, to combine them and let us spend it the way that makes the most sense so that we don't have to continually come back as we okay, learn more. Wrap it up, sir. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tammy Camel. Hello, City Council. My name is Tammy Camel. I'm calling, I'm, I'm coming up here in concerns of I called a couple of weeks about the sidewalk, the city sidewalk that is my property, but if I park across the sidewalk, I get a ticket. But the sidewalk is lifting so bad, in order for me to repair it, I have to remove the tree if the tree is damaged, but the tree is not damaged. So I'm just trying to figure out what is the process of getting help for people that need help with their sidewalks being lifted in the area, in different areas. It's not a question or no, an answer. No, it's not a question. Yeah. I'm just I'm, okay. I'm looking at you. But I'm not okay. asking you, but I'm saying right. this is my concern about the sidewalks being lifted and the repair. I called the city hall, 
and talked to someone about it. Then I got a paper back saying I had 30 days to get it repaired. So that's why I'm here to see about the process for that. Somebody will get a hold of you because they now it is in front of city council. So we're going to be looking for an answer as well. Okay, thank so you. You should get something real shortly from that department head. Thank you. You're so welcome. Our next speaker is Mary Gavon Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary J. Gavan Lewis. I am a retiree from the, from the Saginaw Public School. Uh, eight years ago, I joined Women's uh, Colors. Um, I said, let me find something to do. And I'm so glad that the Lord put me there because I love trying to give back to my community uh, with time, dealing with kids. To this day, I see an old student from Coulter School in here now. And women of colors do so much uh, for the community. It's a nonprofit. We just asking for some support from the city, We're trying to establish a building so we can do more and have a stable place. So. We can do different things. We have so many different things that Women's of Color does. Uh, Evelyn Montgomery, Vicki Hills, and a lot of other females that are in here, in, in, in the room as of now. So we're just asking for some more support to help us get a building. And I hope that you all see that this organization is really doing good things, great things, and they are very known. Well, I'm going to put me in there, too. We are very known around the city and not just Saginaw, other places as well. So with this being said, I just hope that you all give us more support like you have been, and we just want to thank you for the things that you have done. And um, just keep Women's of Colors in mind and try to help us get somewhere stable so we can have somewhere to call our own. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christy Phillips. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And my name is Christy Phillips, and I am a program coordinator for Women of Colors, and I'm also a prevention specialist. And I'm going to kind of echo some of the sentiments of Mary. But, and I've been with Women of Colors for three years. And when I started working there, the building was owned by uh, Learn to Earn Academy. And in fact, I worked there almost a year being the only person in the whole building because it was during COVID. But um, the work that Women of Colors does is just phenomenal. I mean, we have a small staff, but it is so much the the, the work that we do is vital to the community and it's so important and there's so many different things that we do and it is not owned by the board of education and i think you all know they've asked us to vacate the premises by august and in addition to the many things that women of colors does in the community we currently teach four life skill classes at that building where we are now at success academy as well as thompson middle school mackinac academy tricap Emmaus House, and we just graduated two classes at Arthur Hill, and we plan to start restart classes in the fall at Bridgeport and Holy Cross, and um, I actually teach some of those classes, but primarily we teach life skill classes, and of course the TriCat we teach to those residents to kind of help them re-entry back into a society, but also the classes that we teach, the life skill classes that we teach for the children. It is so important and it's so vital, and it teaches them a lot of things as far as the choices that they make and the low-risk choices and versus the high-risk choices and the consequences. And women of colors, we desperately need a building. We need our own building to avoid being displaced again. Saginaw is hurting right now, and it's going to take the village to come together to comfort the residents. And Women of Colors is an agency committed to making a difference. 
With a proven track record for the impact we make and 31 years of uninterrupted service is our proof of dedication to this community. We ask for your commitment and assistance for the purchase of our own building for 31 or more continued years of uninterrupted service in our own space to continue the work we're doing without having to be relocated and asked to leave again. So that's all we're asking for your commitment. We do thank you for the funding that we have received. And we just ask that you please, when you're at the table and you're thinking about how that money is going to be spent, that if you consider women of colors, it would make a big impact on the community. And we have proven that we are committed to this community. And we just ask your commitment to women of colors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Frederick Stewart. How you doing, Council? Hello. My name is Fred Stewart, and I'm, I'm talking about my subject today. So, uh, I'm a property owner at 2931 Russell. And what I'm discussing today is a variance for a carpool that's on that property. I do a lot for the community, especially for the youth. I change a couple of kids' lives. And the problem is that when I do things up under there, sometimes it rain. And I just wanted to carpool up over there. So I put it up there, not knowing that for a carpool, I thought that would be an exception for, you know, to put it up there without the permit. But I guess I was wrong. But what I would like to know is I would like to get, like, a special variance from the local zoning group if it was possible. Or what I got to do to have that going. I know they said I need a resident on the house, I mean on the land. But I do so much for the community, you know, I can't stop, I can't let these kids down. I'm talking about, I give out, I'm talking about I have police there, fire trucks, some officials that came there. And, you know, that's something that I like to do. And, you know, we call that area, it's called, it's on the south side of town, it's called the tree. And one of our models is love and positivity is all I have for you. We don't, if anybody come up under there, you have to share. We don't look for nothing. I don't take no donations. I come out of my own pocket. And the only thing I'm trying to do is show these kids a better way. And I've been doing it since 2015. I feed the community, I give out free bikes, give out free tablets, and that's the only thing I'm looking for is the zoning group to approve a special variance. So I can keep, it's a, it's a carpool, it's a roof only carpool. I'm not putting no sides on the block, but you know, when the person comes to the corner, they can see. I'm not trying to block nothing. All I need is a roof over the picnic tables. I have a bunch of kids, y'all have photos right there, so when y'all get the time, I would appreciate it if y'all sit down and look at it. But, that's basically what all I have to say. I just need to, uh, I just need to, um, the approval for that. So is there some way that I could get a special variance for that? Because the local zoning group, they can do something about it. But will they? I don't know. I'm still learning as I go. So thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Our final speaker is Michael Henteman. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Council Members. So, Good evening. Oh, a little more. Sorry. I apologize. Um, I'm not always the most, uh, uh, excuse me, this is my first time in a public forum, so I apologize if I stumble at all. So I am, um, I am with MTH Property Management Company, representing Brookwood 60 LLC, also recently renamed as Meadowview Estates. Um, and this is in regard to the 2024 non-owner occupied registration fees. So, in short, we're, uh, our company is new to management in the Saginaw area. Um, there was a bit of a misunderstanding that we had regarding some of the fees and um, how our internal processes of invoicing and the such work. Um, and I'm just looking today to see if I can make any type of a public appeal uh, regarding the penalty of the fees, if there could be any type of forgiveness granted. I did see that this is something that's part of code, and I recognize that. You know, I'll fully admit that there was a... What is it? The payment of the fees was made about a week and a half or two weeks um, later than what the due date was. We had been trying to organize cash around in order to make the payments initially. Uh, 
there was uh, some work that we are doing in order to get the rubbish bill taken care of. With us being new to management in the area, we weren't anticipating a very large rubbish bill like the, the annual fees. We'd only been managing for about a year, so just kind of new to how it works here. Um, and then there was the registration. Um, we were catching up on making the payments on the rubbish fee. Um, and then we had found out that we had to take care of that and get that resolved before being able to pay down the registration. There's a little bit of uh, a hiccup there, but we've made payments on the base amount of the registration fees. We took care of that. I think we overnighted payments on March 6th. I think the initial due date was February 23rd. Our intent was not to, you know, uh, skirt around fees or anything. It was just a you know an internal mistake as far as how we were getting the logistics of the payments done. So it was you know I just wanted to apologize. It was just an honest mistake. We you know once again this was just something that was kind of new to us. Um, I was not aware of the gravity of the fees at that point being a hundred percent. Um, and I'm just looking to see if there would be anything that could be done to, you know, alleviate that or work with us. Maybe take the, um, because it's about $8,800 in fees, which is, you know, a little bit big. Um, and it does kind of cut into, you know, the property a bit. It's not like the most cash flush of locations. And I'm just looking to see if maybe we could put the fees into either next month or next year's registration or apply it towards something else so that it's at least being, you know, Put towards the uh, uh, the use of the property in some way. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Again, you will get a response from that department head, and we will get a copy of the results. Thank, thank you. you so much, Madam Clerk. Mayor, we are now at remarks of council. Council members, you have three minutes as well. Please don't go over your three minutes. <laughs> we will begin tonight with Councilman Flores. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be fast. Uh, hello, Saginaw. It's hot in here. Is that just me, or is it really hot in here? I think it's hot. It's hot in here. That's funny. There's the eclipse, and it's the hottest day in the chamber. Did anybody see the eclipse? Hands? I looked at it once without glasses, so... Wrong to do, but it was amazing. My son and I saw it a whole bunch. <laughs> but I'm fine. I could see everything just fine. So uh, I hope everybody had a happy Easter. Thank you to all the public speakers, especially to the MAC and the women of color. You guys have been doing some great stuff with the ARPA money already been provided to you, and we're looking into further allocation. So thank you for uh, your public comments. Uh, also, just real quick, at the MAC, there's going to be uh, an event uh, no relation. It's Flora E Festival. Uh, f festival. It's live music, car shows, and vendors. Uh, again, Mac is 1537 South Washington. It's going to be this Saturday from 12 until 6. And uh, from my understanding, there's going to be a lot of Selena that's going to be being played. So it should be a great time. Uh, and then additionally, I had put in a request for um, Chief Roof to kind of give us an update on, you know, the spring and summer months are coming up. We know that the uh, violence, gun violence especially, tends to have an uptick during those months and just their plans moving forward. So thank you for all that information that you've given. It's very data-driven. Uh, hopefully the, the city manager could put it on our website. Um, it, it's a strategic plan, yet we always know that crime is sporadic, but just to let people know we're really focused on it. Uh, so I put that uh, request of information in on March 22nd. We had uh, another 15-year-old that was shot and killed on uh, March 31st. So it's just sad to see uh, after the information came through that we, we're still kind of entering those months. So everybody, please take care of each other. And then um, last, if anybody has any information on the uh, murder of Keyshawn Banks, Quan Lee, Quay Smithers, Mario Bulger, Pamela Whitson, Ryan Clemens, Roy Whitson III, Cortez Hampton, Mazzy Rudditson, uh, Jonathan Lamar Van, Ronald Pacheco, uh, and Delance Stevens. Please call 1 800 422 5245. That's Crime Stoppers. Um, I dread thinking that more people are going to end up on this list. And I really want us to uh, come together as a community and do all we can to, to not have that happen. And that's all I have. Thanks. 
Thank you. Next we have Councilman Copeland. Good evening, City of Saginaw. Thank you all so much for our public speakers that shared this evening. Due to this heat, my comments will be short. Thank you for being here. Thank yeah. you, Madam Mayor. That was short. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman <laughs> Sylvia. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you all for uh, coming to your City Council meeting today. Uh, I just love it uh, when you all come and take part and listen and see what we're doing and what we're not doing and what we can do better and what we're doing, already doing better. And um, I'd like to thank the uh, public speakers, uh, Women of Color, the MAC Center, of course. And I, I actually wanted to say the information about this Saturday for the MAC, but I'm all right. So I, I think I love to see the, the uh, cars, the car shows. I just love them. But... Um, Hopefully, uh, everyone's uh, information can be answered in a timely fashion. So that's all I have to say, because I am too hot. Thank you very much, <laughs> and you all have a marvelous day. Thank you. Councilman Williams. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Thank you to our public speakers. And as my fellow council uh, people have said, I'm hot, too. Um, <laughs> But I do want to piggyback uh, Councilman Flores uh, as far as crime goes. If you see something, say something. That's right. If you see something, say something. Uh, we as citizens, our community is so much stronger when we stand in support of our police department. And the one thing about the Saginaw Police Department that has been consistent is that they are involved in the community. Mm -hmm. They come out, they support, they try to be at every event, and I believe they are at every event. Um, that goes on. So in turn, we as citizens, we need to stand together and stand with our police department, and that's what keeps our community safer. Not all the way safe. No community is going to be all the way safe, but it keeps us safer if we stand together. Thank you, Mayor. You can tell you left for law enforcement. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Next, we have Councilman Balls. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess I'm going to speak on some of those same lines, but I'm not going to give up my time <laughs> because we have some serious issues here in the city of Saginaw and got a lot to do with the kids and the young adults and I'd like to thank the women of color for doing all you do for our community uh, the MAG Center I thank you guys for doing what you're doing the Big Brothers and Sisters program Boys and Girls Club all the community centers here in the city of Saginaw we all trying to pour into these kids and and help them to be productive members of society but it's obvious y'all we got some problems here because we keep getting to the same predicament we having kids murder each other, or accident with guns and stuff like that. I just happen to be a member of the Big Brothers and Sisters program for 30-some years, and I'm helping out with the mentoring program called HELP. And that young student, the 15-year-old student, was one of our members in the HELP organization. And the meeting that we had uh, last Saturday, we dealt with, uh, talked about guns, uh, tell somebody, telling the kids, if you know somebody and you're hanging around with them, and they got a gun, you need to tell on them. It ain't snitching. You know, we had, to, we had to explain to them the difference between snitching and telling on somebody so that you don't get hurt. You snitch on somebody, if y'all plan to do a crime together, <laughs> and then you end up telling on him, that's snitching. And both of y'all did the crime. But when it comes to doing, seeing kids with dangerous guns and things of that nature or drugs, they need to talk about that with their parents and stuff like that because it can lead to something else. And all of us adults know where it leads to because we've been through things like this in this nature, but the young kids, they just don't get it sometimes, you know, so, and then we have a problem with not a lot of fathers being at home. Everybody know what the drug trade have get, did to our community, and it's not going to get any better unless we tell these kids that don't pick the dope up in the first place. But we got to have somebody out there mentoring them. I really thank you ladies for doing all you do in this community. Um, uh, Reggie, Everybody else, I mean, if there, almost everybody on this city council is involved in another organization to help out our community. And all you guys are here, too, doing the same thing. But we, the only way we're going to win is we got to be consistent. we got to be consistent with these kids, and things do get better. Uh, the kids that I work with uh, in my neighborhood and stuff, man, you can see them growing, the lights turning on and stuff like that. And, and, and all they take is just spending a little time. Spend, investing some time in these kids pays off way more dividends than you ever would know because a lot of times they come back and tell you. I had one to come back and tell me uh, recently um, I got him into the uh, heating air conditioning uh, trade. And he came back and he got a new car 
And he was all happy and stuff and came by and knocked on my door. And, man, before he left, I told him, don't never come over my house doing this again because I had tears in my eyes when he left. But it was good to see the kids are doing better for themselves. So all we got to do is just each one teach one and things will get better. Thanks for letting me share that. Thank you. Next we have Councilwoman Garcia. Good evening, concerned citizens of the community. Thank you for our public speakers that came out this evening. Women of Colors, keep up the great work that you guys have been doing for over the past 20 years or so. Um, and also to Mr. Bobby DeLeon at the MAC Center. And John, um, great talks we had. Um, can't wait to see the end results. Um, I know that you guys had a little bit setbacks. And of course, with our Michigan weather, it doesn't always go plan accordingly to the way we want. But um Hang in there, there's light at the end of the tunnel, so can't wait to see all that. And of course, they have um, the Selena tribute this Saturday, so I wanna go and it's gonna be a nice day for that as well. Um, and also, if you know anybody in need, there's uh, quite a few food giveaways, so that's kinda good. I know right now with the cost of everything going up. Um, this Friday, the Center of Hope, 723 Emerson, Saginaw, Michigan, 48607. We'll start at 10 a.m. if you know anybody in need. Friday as well at 10 a.m. The UAW Local 699, 1911 Bagley Street, Saginaw, Michigan, 48601. Friday as well at noon, the Radiant Church of God, 708 West Genesee Ave, Saginaw, Michigan, 48602. And uh, Saturday the 13th at 10 a.m., Old Town Christian Outreach. And they're always there, whether it rains, snows, tornado, whatever. They're, they're great about always serving the community. Um, so if you know anybody in need for those things, and I hope everybody had a great Easter with their loved ones. Um, I got to spend it doing the Easter Bunny, and I didn't fall this year, so kudos to me for not breaking a leg or anything. But, yeah, so just like you said, we need to silence the violence, increase the peace. I know that was a big thing back towards, like, the 90s, I believe. Um, I think we need to keep that going. It all starts with our youth, and I know, like, a lot of people, and that's our main focus because they're at that age where they're a sponge, and they're absorbing everything, you know, so we need to get them at an early age to help them succeed later in life. So one day maybe they might be in one of our roles being a leader as well. So we want to make sure that we're reaching out to our youth and let them know that, hey, we're there for you. You know, I see a lot of great upcoming leaders and it makes me so proud, you know, to see that they're catching on and they're not giving up, you know. So we just got to continue to keep doing the fight, you know, and that's what we got to do while we're here. So thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening and thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mayor Pro Tem Bench. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, too, want to thank our public speakers for being here tonight. Of course, thank you to Women of Colors for all their hard work, and also to uh, Mr. Ayala and Mr. De Leon of the MAC Center. Thank you for everything that you guys are doing, and um, I'm really excited to see the, the house and all of the work that has gone into that beautiful house that you guys have over there. Um, and thank you for the conversation before the meeting. Um, and other than that, I think I just want to make sure that I thank our Human Planning Commission because they are all volunteers and they take a lot of time out of their personal lives to meet in the meetings and deliberate over ever-dwindling dollars and um, the needs that are always increasing. So um, they're not always easy decisions and you have to kind of pick and choose what, how, and well, you know that with our ARPA dollars, how difficult that is. And I'm grateful that we don't have to do that on an annual basis the way you guys do. So thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you for being here for the presentation and our vote and all that. Um, but then thank you for your service to the community. And that's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. She got that clock watch too. <laughs> Listen, first of all, I want to say thank you to the community. On last Saturday, I had the opportunity to do what I've been doing for the past four years with some business people in the city of Saginaw. We did an Easter basket giveaway. I had community people who came out to help. Ms. Lamar helped us. We've had children that came out to help. We gave out over 2,500 baskets to kids, and we did not put Easter on hold. There were agencies who canceled because of rain. We didn't cancel. One of the things that I learned today, I had an opportunity to go to Jesse Ross. Let me get it right. And I spoke to the third, fourth, and fifth graders. They're starting their testing process tomorrow. It's very important that we as adults, if you've got children, they're starting their testing process. We need to make sure that they get in the bed, 
get some rest, and we need to make sure we feed them something in the morning before they go to school. If these schools' test scores are not high enough, I need everybody to understand this. They're going to shut them down. I'm in this chair right now because of Buena Vista High School in 2012. They shut the school down in April, and I fought like hell to get it back open with some more people, and we did. I just need for everybody to stop looking for your neighbor to do it. If you see it, come on and help. Those children, I told them if their test scores came up, which I pray that they do, because we need a school on the south end. We don't need no more schools closing. We need Jesse Ross. So anybody that knows any kid that goes to any of the public schools, it's testing process starting tomorrow. We need to make sure they've got something to eat in the morning. If not, get up and send them to school. They got food for them. You just have to get them there. I know I'm fussing. I know I'm fussing. But I looked at them little munchkins today, and I said to myself, this is my future. Some of them is just as bad as I was. But they paid attention, and all they wanted to do was hear me say, I know you can do it, and I love you. Sometimes just a kind word can go a long way. So if you got some little munchkins in your neighborhood, Please encourage them to go to bed for the next four weeks because they're testing, okay? And if those test scores come back bad, I don't work for the public school system. I have a granddaughter who goes to Sasa. She's a 4.9. How did she get there? We test her. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. That takes us to reports from the manager. Mr. Manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And do apologize for the heat in the room today, but you recall the project that you all approved some time ago <laughs> for new air conditioning and ventilation, but the boiler system is very old, and uh, that was on today because of the time of the year, and then when we tried to turn the air on, we found that it was frozen. So uh, some issues here. Hopefully we can get that fixed, and uh, we'll have a new system soon enough, so we won't have that issue any longer. Um, we do have a presentation this evening and just a few items before that. Uh, council members um, have an opportunity to meet with the representatives from Corning who are uh, investing in Saginaw County and they're looking at um, how to fill a lot of jobs fairly quickly and also uh, looking at some other issues on helping to provide transportation if there's people from the city that may be able to work there but can't get there child care issues and different things like that so um, if you would like to do that please contact Vicki Davis in my office the city has do, does have a new web page as well technical services staff worked with Civic Plus so if you get an opportunity that went live last week it's specifically designed to be easier to navigate and to be able to use with smartphones and tablets which most people are engaging on so um, Check that out, and uh, we did have the uh, presentation and the public hearing today, but I do want to recognize the city's Water and Wastewater Administration. Um, they noticed that some of the scoring um, could potentially be improved with some different philosophies in our application process for grants, and they implemented some of those, and we were re recently notified that on the latest um, round of application for EGLE grants, to strategically improve our system. Uh, we're third on the priority list now, which is great because uh, it's, it's not a huge amount of funding, it's, but it is a half a million dollars uh, from the clean water plan. And it looks like they're gonna fund the top 17. So we should get funding for that. So we'll continue to work on that. And finally, um, our group on uh, city council and city staff has been working to uh, try to get uh, Barry as a sister city for the city. We're moving that forward and we plan to have host them here during the Memorial Cup and it'll be an opportunity for council members to meet with them. Hopefully we can have an agreement signed with them and have an event here at City Hall. We're going to host them for two days so we'll get that information when we have the plan finalized. Um, and we 
had an item on our last agenda from the Historic District Commission, so Council requested an update from our HDC. So Alex Mixter, who is our Historic District Commission Chairman, is here today to provide you information regarding that item. Well, thank you, evening. Alex. Good evening. I'd like to say thank you for the time tonight. Um, this is one of my favorite topics that I could probably talk about for hours, but I promised that I would not talk for hours. Um, so. One of the things that we've been doing lately is really looking at what we have within the city of Saginaw. Um, and this really all began with a look at the master plan. It's only a couple pages in that you can actually see um, a whole bunch of historic sites that are located on this map. Um, and that kind of prompted us to think about what we do protect, what we oversee. Um, and it really prompted the question, uh, we should be looking at these and really taking inventory of which historic, um, which historic sites, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that, uh, we need to look at uh, the things that are important to us. And so I think it's really important to look at the legend on here because we have uh, quite a few historic sites, but not all of these are actually protected by the Historic District Commission. Uh, there's a lot of differences. In fact, if you look at the legend on the right, uh, we're looking at things that are on the National Register and also things that are locally protected and also things that would be eligible um, to be protected under the HDC. Um, so I want to you know, kind of give a quick lesson on uh, the difference between the National Register um, and the local historic districts. Um, Really, we have more items on the National Register than we do locally protected. And this is actually a national recognition that goes all the way up to the Department of the Interior. Um, so one of the advantages of being on the National Register, it's primarily a recognition, but you become eligible for a 20% tax credit, which is a very substantial cost. And there are a number of projects throughout the city of Saginaw that have actually taken advantage of that. Um, and it's not just the structures, it's uh, the parks, it's, uh, it could be a neon sign. There are a number of things that hold meaning to the community, and those are the things that we need to be looking at. Locally, though, we do not oversee things that are on the National Register of Historic Places. So what we're looking at uh, is trying to figure out which things that are on the National Register or not registered at all that we should be looking at. Um, and really, all the exterior work that is done on these locations is brought before the... Um, I'm sorry, brought before the HDC. Um, and we are also looking at what we need to identify, as I mentioned, which is uh, a charge of ours in the ordinance. Um, and there are local tax credits that we're able to get through that, but uh, those are a little harder to get, but I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, Local historic districts that we do have, um, we have two different kinds. One you can kind of think of as a neighborhood. So we have three neighborhoods, essentially. Uh, one is Heritage Square. The other one's the Old Town Business District. And then uh, pretty much north of Court Street, all along um, uh, North Michigan Avenue, we have a number of homes and beautiful churches and buildings uh, that we protect. And then for the individual buildings, we've got the Temple Theater, uh, the, the Armory in Jefferson One, and only recently, we just recently added the Potter Street Station. And when we look at the National Register, there's a problem that kind of becomes obvious, which is that we have homes like the Charles Peters home, uh, which has been gone for about 20 years now. And that's on the, um, that's on the master plan, that's on the National Register. Uh, 1514 North Michigan Avenue is just outside of the North Michigan Avenue district, and we lost that one in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great example of a building that's not on the local district. It's not on the National Register, but it is eligible. This was one of my favorite buildings until there was an emergency uh, where it had to be brought down in 2021. So a year before we published our master plan, uh, we lost this uh, beautiful structure. It's one of my favorites. And if we look at the... Um, why they made these things into uh, historic sites on the National Register, you can actually go back and read what they were doing half a century ago that brought them to the conclusion that these things were important. But what that does is it kind of gives us a snapshot of what the neighborhood used to look like. So uh, when they did this, you know, all the way back in 1979, there were 390 buildings. And we looked at this and thought, okay, how many of those remain? Well, 263 of those have already been demolished in one neighborhood. So more than two-thirds of this district that was identified, you know, more than 50 years ago, uh, 
we no longer have. And this is where the novelty of uh, of historic preservation really comes into action because it's important to recognize these as homes. It's not just you know a cool old building, um, it's homes. And if you talk to any of the realtors, we have high demand here and low inventory, and we're looking more at people rehabbing things because the cost of new construction is so astronomical that it's becoming uh, more in trend and cheaper to restore. So the implications of that, though, beyond the historic value, um, one block in that neighborhood, uh, if you look at what it generated just last year for all the property taxes, you got just over $18,000. And that two-thirds of a loss is really reflected if you look at an adjacent, um, if you go about one block over, and you got just under $6,000 that this one block is generating. And a house can you know, generate up to $2,000 a year in revenue. A vacant lot's around $80. So that difference in what we're able to capture is pretty astronomical. But we've been doing our homework. Um, and just um, in uh, 2022, we created the, um, the, I'm sorry, the very first local historic district in 19 years. Um, so I'm very proud of the fact that our commission has really, you know, restarted a process that we've really needed to get going for quite some time. Uh, currently under study, we've got the Rothke houses. Um, we actually heard from the friends of Theodore Rothke that they would like to see these preserved. Um, and we also have the Behringer building, which is uh, a fantastic bit um, example of the kind of architecture that was going on at the end of the 1800s. And I would like to thank Mr. Morales and all of the city staff who have put a lot of thought into this building and what kind of investment we could make um, to, tr uh, to try to drive this towards, oops, did I do, nope, uh, try to drive this towards actually being uh, completely redeveloped. The next school we have is what was Hanley Elementary. And uh, this is, is a school that's in the school district that we need to really be looking into to figure out how to reuse this building. Um, schools are actually one of the best things to rehab because these big classrooms can be converted into apartments and all kinds of living scenarios for the people who need the housing the most. And we'd like to help in that conversation. But uh, that's three of many. And we have um, a lot of work ahead of us, and I think it's important to note that there are only about three or four people who are volunteers who are doing these historic district studies, and they take time. Uh, and you know, like, while we appreciate the patience, um, we have a lot of work ahead of us to identify these things and make sure that you know, just because it's not listed as historic does not mean that it's not historic. Um, and the one that we're looking at right now that came to you at the last meeting is this one right here. Um, and this one is very important to us because it contains the, uh, the very historic intersection of, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Genesee and Washington. Um, this is the only uh, complete intersection in the entire city of Saginaw that has all of its buildings on all four corners. Uh, just north of this is the only block that has all of its buildings in all of downtown. So we actually have um, a really, really incredible resource here with a lot of great examples of architecture throughout the history of Saginaw. But it's also important to think about this in context of um, what we used to have in these areas. And when we talk about redeveloping these areas, it's important to note that the HDC does not oversee new construction. But what we're seeing is what do we have left, what's relevant to us, what's important to us, and we encourage new development. Because this is a view from 1936, and uh, uh, close to 100 years later, there's only a handful of buildings left on that block. Um, and one of them is actually the oldest building in downtown. And this one, um, uh, this has been had a heavily modified over time. Uh, you might think that this is three buildings, but we actually found this in the newspaper. This is actually one building that's been modified extensively over time. And it's actually very interesting that we ended up basically where we started with this. Because you can see that there's no buildings on the left here, but that kind of points to where we are today versus 150 years ago, because what they did with that was they built it out to this. And they kept building and building onto what they had. And this kind of a block, there's only three uh, structures in this entire picture that are still standing. So things have changed over the years, but they've also changed uh, just in that time frame, because if you look at the block on the right, that turns into this. So half that block comes down. We have a lot of Art Deco that goes up. And now that's come down. And what's going to come next could be 
uh, really, really fantastic, but there's been a lot of modifications over the years. Um, and one thing that is really, really important is that we haven't always had the money to do much with historic buildings. We've always accessed you know, millions and millions in demo funds, but really for the first time we have the kind of money available to us at the state level that we have not had before. And that's really because last year we became a certified local government. Uh, this is one of the most important things that has happened uh, like really in the preservation world here in Saginaw, um, because there's a lot of grants and a lot of things that come to our benefit through being, um, I'm sorry, through being a, a, uh, or a um, excuse, I have a little bit of a speech impediment, so I apologize, but uh, like one of the benefits of being a CLG. Um, and that includes uh, the kind of projects and the planning and the education and the things that we want to provide at the HDC. We want to be a resource. Uh, we want to be able to help people with the why of what we do as opposed to just telling them what to do. Um, and th that is the kind of stuff that they love to fund here, but also the brick and mortar things are also available to us. And it, uh, a lot of what they look for are the things that are historic and that are in public ownership that have been heavily, heavily neglected. Uh, these are things that we can actually turn the clock back on. So when we look at the Mason Building again at the intersection of Washington and Genesee, you can actually see that the old facade they put up in, uh, I believe it was 1960 that they did this. Uh, but what's under there is just kind of peeking out. And that's the kind of thing that really good partnership could do um, to bring all of these pieces together to see this kind of building redeveloped. So how can we spur the development? Um, and how can, we be, um, how can we be utilized as a resource in this process? And I think it's also important to mention, too, that the historic districts are where the majority of the economic development seems to be happening. Because the Old Town Historic District has new apartments, new condos, new townhomes, all kinds of things that are coming to it right now. So if historic preservation was an obstacle to development, we wouldn't be seeing these things in Old Town. But we're very happy to see the things that are coming and the kind of growth that comes and the way that these buildings can be endlessly recycled. So to kind of sum up, uh, the goals we had, we had four of them. We completed all four, and I'm very proud of the commission. Um, we really wanted to look into this inventory as one thing. We wanted to have an active schedule so all the studies we have going right now get completed on time. We wanted to have a full commission because we've had vacancies for a while. We are back at a full commission now. And also we had to do the annual report uh, through being a... a, a um, a community uh, that is a certified local government. Um, and we do that as volunteers to help out the staff here because they have tons on their plate as it is. Uh, the last thing I want to say to close here, when you look at the master plan and um, the question that they had around what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the community, if you look here, um, number four is our history. Number one for weaknesses is blight, which can really tie into historic preservation as well. But it's also important to note that just the word history, there's a lot more to that because you could say vacant buildings, old buildings, architecture, historic buildings, uh, you could say old town, downtown, those are both historic areas. Um, and when you go through the raw data, you start to see that one of the more common themes you hear is that the older homes with character really should be refurbished. Uh, that uh, like our strongest assets are the old buildings and the history rooted in them. And then really loved this one where they said the community and those who strive for improvement. And you can see this in historic restoration projects among other things. So that brings us to about 125 responses that's in the master plan relating to historic preservation. Really only second to the community, which I think is very appropriate because we don't have history without the people who are here. And the people who were here 150 years ago, they were not making history. They were living everyday life, and they were building uh, a lot of great things. And so I think it's very, um, really important to see that we can embrace our past while we look forward to the future. We can use the things we have now that have been here for 150, 180 years, and we can use these things to build the city that we need. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, but that's kind of a general overview of one of the things we're looking at. Uh, and like I said, I could go for hours on this, so I appreciate your time. Thank you for not going out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? Probably. So the 20% the 
uh, tax break that they get? Mm -hmm. that, that, is those local taxes or just uh, federal or state taxes or what? So that is a national tax credit. Um, so they're able to take that off of the total cost of the project. Uh, so if you have a $10 million project, you get $2 million tax credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. This can be taken offline if needed, but with other communities who are doing this work, you were sharing that it's like three volunteers. Do you find that with this new certification, you all may be able to bring additional people in to be paid to do this work for you, to, to will expedite the time that you all are doing? Yes, absolutely, actually. Um, that kind of money that's available to us, uh, the, we could hire a firm that could do these types of studies. Um, the one that did the Cathedral District actually about 10 years ago, they did the study, but it never came to the council to be approved because of uh, how the public hearing went and there were some questions that you know, kind of had to get aired out, but that was all done by a company out of California. Um, if we had the money to be able to uh, really do these kind of historic district studies, it would save uh, the volunteers countless hours and we would be able to kind of direct our uh, the efforts to doing things like the workshops and uh, uh, the more educational things that we could be doing. Um, and that's where we'd like to be more of a resource, is to really see how we can bring things to Saginaw, the kind of workshops we could be doing, the kind of education we could be doing. Um, but that type of funding is crucial for these types of things, because there are companies that do this professionally. Yes. The governor just announced that they got a couple of $200 million, I think, for housing. Uh, are you guys trying to tap into that? Maybe we can use some of that money to uh, refurnish some of the schools and make them apartments. Because all over the state and over the country, you know, they have repurposed schools and they're really beautiful when they get through with them. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the $200 million that was allocated, so I'll have to get back to you on that part. Um, but. It is very, very important to note, like you said, that there are other communities like Flint that are doing this type of rehab work on their old schools. Um, what we have is so much, uh, it's very, very important to utilize what we have because we have people, I mean, even in the public comment earlier, I heard somebody saying that they needed a building uh, and we, we just don't have the inventory right now. So to be able to make these kind of buildings available, to say we have this and it may be kind of a hairy situation because of the obstacles that are ahead of a historic preservation project. There could be problems with the masonry. Uh, it's a lot of work just to do the due diligence up front. Um, but those are the types of things we can offset the costs on. And so what can we be doing um, with what we have to try to drive those things forward and say these things are important and to identify these kinds of buildings and saying you know, these things matter to us um, and we need to be using them in new ways because a school can become so many other different things. Let me just say this. I, I, I'd love the school idea but they're not ours. Mm -hmm. This second our public school. We can't make them do anything. Mm -hmm. So I do like that idea. And I did ask for you to come in front because I need to get a clear understanding. If we get ready to start building up the front, what are you guys doing? Because we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And you've told me a little, but I need more. I need to know what is the future plans? What do you plan to do? Are you looking at landlocking? Because if you're looking at that, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, because downtown is going to come back, but it's going to come back in phases. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with anybody saving anything, but let we got to be real. Some buildings are so far gone. I know you said I was born and raised in Saginaw, yeah. so I know what downtown used to look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not saying that it can't, but I don't want it to look like it used to look. I want it to look better. Okay, so if we can make things better, they may last. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just hear because you wanted us to vote on something, and I'm like, I'm not comfortable because I don't know what they do. Yeah, and so I, for me, I've got a clear understanding, and I can make a conscious decision now, yay or nay. But mm -hmm. before, I'd have said nay, I'd have went with a no. But at least I know now that the commission is trying to save what they can save and that, that we can't say we got to figure out a way to get some money. Mm -hmm. Again, it all takes dollars and cents. 
So it was on our last meeting. We didn't make a decision. I'm sure it's going to come back next meeting. So I need you guys to get all your questions answered because we're going to vote on this next time because we tabled it until the next meeting on the 22nd. So if you guys got any questions about what they're asking of us to do, you need to ask them those questions right now. <clears throat> Sounds like a winner to me. Uh, yes, yes, Councilman Boss. I know we don't own those schools, but I'm sure they would take a, a, a small amount of money for somebody they want to refurnish those schools. Mm -hmm. We have talked to them about that, so I mean, they, they don't want them either. So I'm sure they're selling. Mm -hmm. That's like, fine. I'm just saying. I, I want people, because the audience, I don't want them to think it's us. That's not our building. I don't think they, I think they know these not our buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just add, um, through a lot of the work that Alex and I have done together, um, through our conversations with the land bank and the school district, um, they indicated that us passing these types of things were, were, was our formal indication to them as a governing body <laughs> that we do have an interest in not seeing it dem demolished, that we do have an interest in getting out ahead of it. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. well, mainly what I think that we, we had started out on this endeavor, you know, indicating that, because the land bank manager says, well, if you, you know, pass a historic district, then I have some documentation that indicates to me that this is something I might want to prioritize. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate the work you guys are doing, and I'm glad to see that, that you guys are trying to save what little we have left. Thank you. So. And if we I could on that note, that actually. Uh, don't, under, don't underestimate Saginaw. We got a lot of life <laughs> in this city, okay? We got if I could a lot on of life. Note, people, man. people have to sit back and No, it's not going to be like it was. If that's the case, help us lift the tax cap from 1979. Mm -hmm. Help us lift that. Help us lift that one. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Yes, Mr. F yes, Councilman Flores. Thank you, Mayor. Could you go back to the uh, image of the four buildings in the intersection there? Should be able to. That one is right here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Of those buildings, which one would you think is most important historically to the city of Saginaw? Oh, that's tough. Um, so I would actually argue that the Mason Building is the most um, Really, if there's any picture you look at of our old downtown, really back to the invention of photography, um, you're going to see this building there. And, mm -hmm. and it's been there uh, for years and years as many different things. And I think that's the important thing you know, to note is that we are not going to be bringing back like, uh, you know, the things of the past that are no longer here. We don't have too many blacksmiths that are opening up around town these days. We don't have pressed metal tin shops either. Um, we need to be using these things not for their original purpose, but for what we need to be now. And I think that um, what the Mason Building represents is really what we could do could be very symbolic, especially when it comes to removing the facade and seeing it as it was actually supposed to be built. Um, you have a very beautiful intersection here because you've got 20 years of you know, the architectural history where you go from one building to the next and you go to, um, you know, you got the 1920s with the beautiful Second National Bank building. Um, the, the lobby there is literally why I joined Huntington Bank, uh, because that is just a fantastic building. And you got the Bancroft and the Eddy, those have been restored. Uh, these are all the anchors of our downtown. The one that's being missed all the time is the Mason building. And it's one of the ones that, really because of the facade and because of what it looks like now, um, because of what they did in the 50s and 60s, that. It's, it's kind of unrecognizable. You, you wouldn't even guess that there's a building underneath there. Um, but we're seeing those kinds of removals of the facades all over the country. And those make national headlines. Um, that is a very huge thing in the preservation community, to be removing these things. And I think that within historic preservation, there's a really beautiful, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to word this, but there's a way of righting the wrongs of the past as well. Um, not just you know, architecturally, but using the, the massive inventory of old houses that we have f for things like housing justice. Uh, there are a lot of things that have been done with these homes and old buildings that aren't necessarily uh, the greatest, and we need to be 
you know, really making sure that what we're doing with these buildings is moving the city forward. Thank you. Can you go to the picture that's black and white with all the old buildings? Next one. That one. This one right here. Mm -hmm. So if I was uh, given the same question, I'd argue that all four of them are important because mm -hmm. if you take away one of them, you start to take away all of them. And I think one of the reasons that we had motion to have this conversation is because we have a lack of historical inventory in the city of Saginaw. So we've really come into, I think, in my mind, an identity crisis of who are we currently, who were we, and who are we going to be. Um, but every other city that I've been to and traveled in, uh, it needs to have that type of inventory. I was in Cincinnati on Monday, and there was a building, I was in the neighborhood uh, over the Rhine, which is right downtown on Vine Street. And there was a building that was, you know, 120 years old, Cincinnati, right, right downtown. And they were um, working on that. I think it burnt down, downtown, right next to the Kroger's headquarters. And instead of demolishing it, they're trying to take that whole neighborhood uh, and reduce their... Um, their footprint, uh, carbon footprint, and make it into something that it used to be, but kind of keep their identity into something new. So thank you for the presentation. It's very well thought out. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. just want to say thank you so very much for the presentation. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Morales. And just one uh, final item I wanted to remind Council that we'll be working on providing you an update in uh, late May or early June for all of the ARPA allocations that we have. I know a number of you ask really good questions with these requests that we had about how much had been spent, percentages, and how much was left, and we hope to provide you with that information for all the allocations at that time. So with that, uh, Madam Mayor, that concludes the management update. Okay. Madam Clerk. Any other questions for the manager? Any questions of the city manager? Oh, Any questions for the city manager? Okay. Madam Clerk. All right. That takes us to the consent agenda. The agenda has been available at City Hall and on the city web page and on the SGTV channel 191. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda, leaving room for exception. So moved. Second. Do we have any exceptions? Hearing no exceptions, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. It takes us to board commission and committee reports. Do we have any board commission's report? I'm going back and forth. No, just pointing at each other. That's fine. Oh, okay. Handle your business. Miscellaneous. I know what you're talking about. Miscellaneous. They're doing sign language, so I'm going to let them get their sign language done. <laughs> you want to report something? No. No, thank you, Mayor. You need to make a motion on that uh, allocation. No, no, no. That's no, miscellaneous. Okay. Yeah. That's miscellaneous. All right. That's why I kept it in. Okay, so we don't have any boards or commission reports. Madam Clerk. We are at appointment of board commission and committee members. We have one through nine, one, one appointing, and one and eight reappointing. I got it right this time. I need a motion to approve, leaving room for exception. Some support. Do we have any exceptions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. That takes us to resolutions. Our first on the agenda is to approve the Community Development Block Grant Program Submission Program for year 2024 to 2025. I need a motion to adopt. We'll move. Second. No discussion, right? You can have discussion. Can we ask for discussion? We do. Are there, is there anything that needs to be cleared up as it relates to the CBDG fund? 
Hearing yeah, for it. We've got a motion has been second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. Our next resolution is to approve the home program submission program for year 2024 to 2025. I need a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Do we have any discussions on this? Hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. Our third resolution is to approve the Homeless Assistance Program Emergency Solutions Grant Submission Program for year 2024 to 2025. I need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Do we have any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Our fourth resolution is to approve the MDOT contract 24-5181 for maintenance and operation of the underbridge lighting on the Henry Marsh Bridge. I need a motion to adopt. Moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Do we have any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. Our fifth resolution is to adopt the final project plan for drinking water system improvements and designate an authorized project representative. I need a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. It's been moved a second. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. I just want to say I didn't get to say earlier. I'm appreciative of our water department and how this presentation showed that from the work that we've done previously and what our water department worked on in waste management, that we will not be seeing an additional increase. But they worked diligently prior to this study to put that cost ahead of time to our city that now that we're approving this today, we're, we don't have to worry about an additional cost that's going to impact our citizens because we've already worked on that. Thank you. That's all there. Just to reiterate, we made that discussion when we increased the water bill. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. Our final resolution is to adopt a final project plan for wastewater system improvements and designate an authorized project representative. I need a motion to adopt. So move. Second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. What do you mean when you say authorized project representative? I mean, this is someone that we already got in the department. They got to get somebody else, got to hire a contractor or what? What's water man in? I thought that's who it was. <laughs> <laughs> you changed your look on me. I kept looking. I'm like, this is a lot of me. Good this evening. Is, I'll try to keep this, this is Ken. This is Sorry, I'm Ken, the deputy oh, director of okay. water and wastewater. <laughs> it's all right. I'm like the backup quarterback. So Mike's uh, off uh, today, so I'm uh, leading the charge today. So what this will be, uh, Councilman, is uh, for a new position for an existing uh, employee that we already have. Uh, we're envisioning uh, most likely to be Andy Bill, who's our city engineer. We have a lot of uh, projects coming up with a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, upgrades that are going to be going on in the water and wastewater. <clears throat> the goal is to have him overseeing, just have uh, one person kind of like tie all the information and all the projects, why they're ongoing in that, to work from Mike and myself so we can better uh, receive that information and compile it and bring it back to you and Tim. Okay, so, so an already employee we have? Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Madam Clerk. Takes us to miscellaneous business. Do we have any motions or anything that is coming before this body? Yes. Yes, Mayor. Uh, a motion to uh, adopt the resolution to amend the allocation to the Mexican American Council from $270,000 to $330,000 for eligible capital expenses. There's a motion on the floor. Support. Support. Is there any discussion? Yes. Would we be able to amend what they currently have for programming and just change the verbiage to programming and or capital? Just in case they have an increased capital expense, they don't have to come back to us for that capital change because it's already, no, it's already specified as programming or 
uh, capital or and or programming. Yes, you could allocate it. You could do that. Yes. So with that, um, what uh, Councilman uh, Copeland said, does that change the motion by, uh, or does it change, yeah, does it change the motion by Councilman Ball? Yeah. yeah Flores. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Flores. I'm very sorry. Yeah. Does it, that, does that change the motion? It has to change. Motion, to change. The motion to amend, though. Not yet. There's been no motion to Thank amend. You. Amen. Okay. Let me say this. Mm. For me, I'm not comfortable with that mm. because we don't have report cards. We don't know how much is spent and what it's been spent on. We allocated money in the very beginning, and we need to get to see if they've got funds right now. I would much rather see people spend those because if we've got extra, you're going to get it. But if we jump the gun and start handing out money to one, you got to hand it out to everybody. So I'm not comfortable yeah. with so, that motion. I am comfortable with the fact that they can switch it like they asked us to do. Can they use it for either, either, or? That was the question. No, that was no. That's not what he. That's not what he said. I mean, he increased it. No, let me point out for a second. What he was saying was that they wanted to use some of their own money, not new money, yes. but some of the money that they had. He talking about the money that they already got, if they can use some of that towards uh -huh. infrastructure. That was well, the question. Who were you talking about first? I'm talking Mr. About, Copeland? Yes. Oh, yeah, well, I, he was, but I'm saying the motion that's on the floor, I'm saying I'm not comfortable with because they got monies that they can spend now <laughs> and come we back will. and we're going to have money left over. We made enough trials and errors from this table. So now we need, it's, it's a way that we can correct it. We still going to give them some more money, possibly. Well, we, yeah, you say that. But they've got money on hand right now. Mr. Williams, was you saying something? I'm sorry. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I'm, I'm good. It's hot. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, they still have programming dollars that they have not been able to use yet because they have been working on their capital projects. The request that Mr. Ayala made at the podium was for $60,000 to either be changed from the programming to capital or for their entire programming amount to be changed so they could use it for programming or capital. I would support either one of those um, motions, but I can't support this allocation because it's $60,000 um, of new money and I'm not really sure exactly how the Mexican American Council capital expenditures qualify as uh, workforce development. So I'm a no vote on that as well. Councilwoman Sylvia. Thank you so very much. Uh, I don't know if I was privy to inf information that other council persons was or was not, but I got information from Guide House that. Uh, this particular program was one of the best programs and they would they were spending their money correctly so I, i'm just taking issue saying that we didn't get a report card but we did get a report card in regards to the mexican-american council okay councilman williams earlier uh, manager morales you mentioned we're going to get an update as far as our funds what, what date was that it should be at the end of may so we did look at this one because, you know, we got a request. So at this point for the Mexican-American Council, um, they have allocated, I, I believe, over 56% of their funds, but the majority of that is for this capital project. So they had something in the neighborhood of 230000 I think, for programming. Of the programming, they've spent about twenty. 4,000, somewhere in that range. So they do have a lot of programming dollars left, but they have allocated all of their capital. They don't have any more money in the capital right now. Okay, I did y'all say. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, there was a, um email that came out on, this, I'm sorry, Tuesday, March 26th. Uh, from Guidehouse stating that they're very comfortable 
uh, through the, the amount of documentation that Mac had sent over to all of us, that where they're at currently with their expenditures. Um, so there has been the report card, uh, and it's in my assessment. I'm not a teacher, but an A. So I'll motion to amend the current language to allow for their programming dollars to be used as capital dollars at this point without changing the amount they've been awarded. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Second still because if they did want to use program. No, they, they, they're gonna just no, take we've got a motion without a second yet, so you need second. a second. Discussion. No, I'm just saying if he switches it, does it have to say and or or just in case they do want to use capital once they get it completed? I mean, they probably don't have much time. Does it? But they, they've asked could they switch it over to use it for either or. So, yeah. Right, okay. So, I just want to make yeah. sure the right terminology Yeah, because that's what there. he said earlier. Right. Can we use it for this or this? Correct. Okay. But they want to use it. I just want to make sure the verbiage is correct. Or, yeah, would cover it. Mm -hmm. You know what Yes. Would we also need to then further amend it, and it's probably further amend it to strike the increase? If we're I allowed. think that we need to do that both. I thought his language was that. Motion. I already motioned that. Yeah. Yeah, but we still got to go back and vote on your first one. Correct. And then we come back and do the, the second one. Well, if we amend it, okay. then we don't have to. If, if we make the amendment that he suggested, then we don't need to do the, oh, okay. the first one. Yeah. But, Councilman Flores, it was to allow the programming dollars to be used as capital. That's it. No and or. Yeah. With the and, and, and or. Or capital and or programming or. dollars. Good terminology. Any more discussion? We're going to call for the vote. I'll wait. Can we read it one more time then just to make I was going to have oh. a, <laughs> I was going to have a, it's, it's 30 things on the floor. I need to know which one I'm voting for. Okay. Ms. Chris, I mean, Madam Clerk, can you read the motion? So the motion is to amend the current language to allow for the programming dollars to be used as capital or programming dollars. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's been moved and second. I'm calling for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Do we have any more motions? So that was a motion to amend. We still need a motion on the main motion as amended. You see, it was still the first one, right? No, it's been amended now. I'm listening to what the attorney so said. The amendment increased it. We should have voted no on this and then made it. The, the amendment the replaced the, res the, the proposed the resolution way. language to take out the increase and allow the current allocation right. for programming to be used either or. Increase so we just need to vote on the main that. motion as, as amended. amended. Correct. There you go. I just said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we're going to go back to the original motion with that. Which was it's amended now. You're right, it's amended. amended now, but we're gonna go to the first motion that he made, right? The main motion as amended. Right. The main motion as amended. Yeah. Can you read that? The motion as amended is to um, the current language is to allow for programming dollars to be used as capital or programming dollars. I thought it was the increase. In so it's you're no. approving the no, you struck the language. Okay, the it's been moved in second. Call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. We're still under miscellaneous business. We're still under miscellaneous business. Does anybody? Yes, sir. I like the motion that we join, Mayor Mayor. Well, we're going to do that in a minute. We're still under miscellaneous business. There's a motion that's always under order. <clears throat> no, but before we do that, I wanted to thank, and they left before we could, the, the staff that worked this weekend. For everybody who came in this weekend and worked on that window project, I wanted to just publicly thank them for coming in. Yolanda and her team, you did a marvelous job. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a lot of happy people when they get these new windows in their house. Madam Clerk, 
I'll second Michael's I motion. Need, I need a motion that I ain't finna move till I have till I hit this hammer. I need a motion to approve. Oh uh, yeah, I second okay. his motion. Y'all move this second. Yes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Everybody have a good next two weeks.